You're tuned to 1520 WCAT Radio, and it's time now for the Avid Reader Show with your host, Sam Hankin. Sam will offer reviews and interviews of some of the more interesting books and authors of today, and now Sam Hankin. Afternoon, everyone. Welcome to another edition of the Avid Reader. Today, our guest is David Mitchell, author of The Bone Clocks, published by Random House just two weeks ago. And, by the way, David will be appearing this week, Friday, at the Free Library downtown to read and sign his new book. It's interesting, the admission fee, as usual, is like 15 bucks, seven for students, but they have a deal where if you buy the book and a ticket for admission, it's only 32 bucks, and the book itself is $30, so that's really a good deal. Plus, you get to hear David. So, as far as accolades, David's been called a genius by the New York Times. He's been compared to uh, Nabokov and Tolstoy, but we couldn't get either of them, so we're stuck with, <laughs> we're, we're stuck with David. And here's the thing, too. He was named by Time as one of the most hundred influential people in the world, which was staggering to me, and I thought it was amazing until I realized that he was in the company of Sasha Baron Cohen, Justin Timberlake, John Mayer, who I hate, and Rosie O'Donnell. Uh, so, but to me, it's still pretty cool, and this is the way I look at it. Here's why. Influential means you influence someone, and David's books do that. They influence you. You start the book, and you're a certain person, and then you finish the book, and somehow you're a little different. It's kind of like the Newtonian laws of physics. A moving object tends to remain in motion unless until David Mitchell acts upon it. And, and this action, um, the story we're telling that David has told is it's a story that's told over a span of decades through a, a woven protagonist, Holly Sykes, and, and through that skein, she's further woven with other character characters who are as real as real can be. And in the book, we discover an eternal battle between good and evil, two forces each battling for immortality, one for good, one for evil, primarily with a few slips here and there. So, uh, Back to our world. Our world is just our world. And then when you read the Cloud Atlas or the Bone Clocks, you've kind of been wobbled a bit. So David is the author of The Thousand Autumns of Jakob de Zut, Black Swan Green, Cloud Atlas, and many others, including the acclaimed The Reason I Jump. He's the translator there, which is a story of autism kind of from the inside out. So David, welcome and thanks so much for joining us today. Well, thank you very much, Sam, and uh, that's, uh, that was quite an introduction you gave. Um, other people may wish to put me in uh, the exalted company of uh, Tolstoy and Nabokov, etc., but, um, but, but, but uh, I, I kind of wouldn't dare to uh, elevate myself to those heights. But thank you for your high opinion of me, and, um, and I'll do my best to um, write work that won't disappoint you. Okay. Well, like I said, I have tried calling them several times, and I would have gotten them. <laughs> <laughs> so, first, I always do this. What a great cover for your book. Th did you pick it out? Did you vet it? Did you have anything to do with it? Um, I would like to claim even a gram of credit for it, but uh, it was pretty much a uh, done deal. I'm, 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 I'm allowed some initial input, and because I'm not a book jacket designer, that's usually wisely ignored, and then at the very end, I'm uh, allowed a presidential veto. Uh, but... Uh, when I saw the artwork um, from Random House for the Bone Clocks, um, uh, um, I, I did not want to use my presidential veto at all. Quite the reverse. I, I loved it. I'm really happy with it. The reason I always ask is because I own an independent bookstore, and as many times, uh -huh. yeah, yeah, and it's you know, which is difficult to do nowadays in America. Yeah, yeah but yeah. it's a labor of love. Um, and the reason I ask is because as the owner of one, and as many times as people say to you, you can't judge a book by its cover, everybody who comes into my store judges books by their cover. And I, th yeah. I think that's why publishers leave authors out of it. It's like a chef in a restaurant can't be the manager of the restaurant. And you're the author, but they want books to sell. And I think they're very smart the way they, they do their covers, and I think this, this one's really great. Oh, it's pretty beautiful. Um, and, um... I guess there are authors out there who who are also superbly gifted graphic designers, but but there's probably not many of us, and I do know uh, I do know I'm not one. So uh, and such a great um, art department at Random House. Uh, generally, I've I've always left them to it, and I've never been disappointed. Oh, the other thing is cool that, um, you know, 
because you're like an Nabokov and Tolstoy, <laughs> you don't need blurbs on the back cover, which you hardly ever see in my bookstore. <laughs> oh, that's almost embarrassing. Uh, they're great, immortal writers who will still be read, uh, I believe, three, four hundred years from now. And, 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 and if I'm still being read 30 or 40 years from now, I'll be really happy. That's enough for me. But it's, it's, uh, <laughs> it's really cool that you're not blurred because it makes the back cover look so pleasant, you know? Yeah, yeah. It's um, it is a shame to um, overlay uh, words of eager gushing praise onto a beautiful piece of art. I always feel a little bit uh, sorry for uh, the artists who put their heart and souls into artwork, only to have it um, sort of embossed with superlatives about the author. I guess they're used to it, but uh, but um, it is nice when that doesn't happen, and when hopefully the book can. Um, Speak, Stand on its own. Uh, on its own m- merits, and maybe the reputation of the author as well. But reputation is a fickle thing, of course, and it comes and goes, and it's good not to take things for granted. Well, before we started, I said I tend to blab a lot, so and blither or whatever, blather. So make, make sure you s- stop me. <laughs> so the uh, qu- Not at all, not at all. <laughs> the first question I have, I guess, am I a bone clock? Are you a bone clock? Yes, yes. Uh, unless you've done a secret deal with a shadowy circle of immortals that uh, uh, that promise you um, that your relationship with mortality can be renegotiated, then yes, uh, you are a bone clock. Uh, it's a rather disparaging term that um, people who are onto a way to outfox death uh, have for the rest of us uh, who age and they see from our faces how much of the the time that we have to live in our lives is already gone and how much is left. So yeah, uh, it's a form of disparagement. Well, it's funny, it's like the bad guys here are taking shortcuts uh, to achieve immortality. The good guys, well, partly unwittingly, but they do it the right way. And this is like what we were talking about before we started, which was how you like to almost, I guess, immerse yourself in something rather than go to Wikipedia and cut and paste it into your book. You know what I mean? Oh, I wouldn't want to do that. I think, right, um, readers are very clever people and uh, they know when a cut and paste job uh, has been done and and, 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 and I wouldn't want to insult their intelligence by... uh, by letting them think that I thought I could get away with it. Uh, and anyway, where's the pleasure in that? The pleasure in writing is, is, is in realizing an, an imaginative world and, and, and putting your heart and mind and soul into it and making it work and making it real. And um, cheating not only sort of cheats the reader in the way you suggest, but it, it also cheats yourself. Uh, it, it deprives yourself of the best part of pleasure you get through hard work and through hopefully good work um so yeah and i think that translates with like you said i think it resonates with the reader because readers are smart um and and, you know you say making it real and here's something people have asked you and you kind of make fun of yourself in the book where you talk about uh let's see how do you say it a book that's half fantasy is like a woman who's half pregnant And, and yet your book is I wouldn't say half fantasy, but... <laughs> yes, I know what you mean, yeah. Um, uh, that was a cheeky line of mine where I'm <laughs> having my cake and eating it too. Uh, yeah, you were. It was actually... Uh, I mean, I, I, I need to credit that line with uh, to Lana Wachowski, actually, one of the directors of The Matrix and also the Cloud Atlas movie. I was describing the story to her, and I heard myself say, well, it's kind of a half fantasy and she just responded by saying it can't be half fantasy any more than the book could be half pregnant but in a way the novel's made of six different novellas one of them is out and out full on if you're going to take Vienna take Vienna kind of <laughs> fantasy uh, uh, it's a war uh, between um, two groups of people who are able to bend the laws of physics uh, in ways that we aren't however the other five novellas that make up the novel um, with the exception of a few sort of precursors of the war uh, and a sort of coda of the war as well with the exception of those they are actually uh, not fantasy they're 
written in the realist mode. One is political, one's almost military, and then there is a, a sort of pastiche. Uh, the future one's a kind of a future dystopia after oil's um, more or less depleted, uh, set in the 2040s. So, um, um, in a way, yeah, uh, the book is actually only one sixth fantasy and five sixths not. So I get to use Lana's line and kind of bend it a little bit as well. Well, what's cool, and I do like a lot of science fiction and fantasy, is that the reader is, is kind of fooled in a way because in the beginning with Holly Sykes and the disappearance of a particular person, you only get these slight intimations in the shadows that something more is going on that really meets the eye. It's you may be really reading a thriller or a mystery, but then out mm -hmm. in the corner, of, uh, it's like when you look out of the corner of your eye and you see something, like Pink Floyd, you know, like Comfortably Numb. You know, you, you see something. I know that line. It's a great song. Yeah. Yeah, what is it? Um, oh, shoot. Uh, when I was a child, I caught a fleeting glimpse out, out of, of the corner, corner of my eye. eye. I turned looking to look, glimpse. but it, it was, was gone. gone. <laughs> I can't tell you, you, know, you would not understand. I know too much. <laughs> <laughs> it's remember. It's funny because I went to a boarding school like that, and I yeah. remember in James Joyce's portrait of the artist of a young as a young man. He goes to a boarding school like that, and in the front is piece how he writes James Joyce, or he writes um, Stephen, St Stephen De Dedalus, and then he writes Earth, solar system, galaxy, and that's the way I always felt it. You know, like you start, you know, inductively, you know, from the smallest part all the way to the outer part, and that's kind of what the book is like too. It's like kind of a miniature that gradually becomes this giant conflagration between these two incredibly um, strong forces. I like that metaphor very much, Sam, and with your permission, I'll recycle it in the future, if that's okay. Yeah, it's funny. You know, you know what's so much fun, and I imagine it was fun for you, um, is writing about the near future because yeah. you're able to make it the same world we're in Although more so, like when you talk about Justin Bieber's fifth divorce. <laughs> yes, um, yes, uh, you can have uh, lots of fun with the near future. Um, there's enough clues and enough evidence uh, in the present. You can see trends and you can continue them and sort of e and extrapolate curves over the next maybe twenty or thirty years. Uh, in a way that you can't really do over the next two, three hundred years, where you do have, on the one hand, you have more of a blank slate, uh, so you do get to make everything up and you sort of have less, you're less beholden to the present. Uh, but on the other hand, it is a blank slate, so you have to do that, so you don't get any help from the present. Uh, the near future is an interesting place to write about, most certainly. Yeah, and once again, that goes towards, well, is this real? Is this fantasy? Is this the world I live in? Is it the world I live in in 2018, which is being my age, um, happens in a flash, in a moment? Hey, did you? Yeah. Did you ever own a uh, Sinclair ZX81? Uh, I did own a Sinclair ZX81, and then uh, a Sinclair Spectrum. Spectrum. Uh, but only a 16K at first because I couldn't afford the 48K on my pocket money. I um, know. But, uh, <laughs> I remember when I bought my first 20 meg drive that sat underneath my Apple and it cost me $400. Now you'd have a thumb uh, drive like that and you'd throw it in the trash can. <laughs> uh, our science and our technology is, uh, is superb at uh, computing power, uh, miniaturizing things kind of at the nano scale. And of course, it's still fueling the whole show pretty much with the exception of nuclear fission, which has, which has other problems of its own, on kind of a 1940s technology, coal oil burning power grid. Uh, and um, it's sort of this fact that I sort of extrapolate into the 2040s and just speculate, well, what will happen when the juice is out, when the juice runs out and there's no more oil to the rest of it? Because uh, it, uh, it seems that our godlike standard of living is, come, well, not for all of us, but for the more fortunate few in the first world, uh, is resting on um, Apple-type technology, uh, micro-technology, nanotechnology, which is nonetheless founded itself on something much older, dirtier, and unsustainable. It's funny because the converse is also true when you think about the fact 
that between 69 and 72, we went to the moon six times on technology that's now contained in the guts of a iPhone, ooh, a new iPhone 6. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and, but what happened? Other than Elon Musk, there isn't much going on. Um, um, with interstellar exploration, you mean, or, or interplanetary exploration? Yeah, I mean, shouldn't we have gone, yeah. I mean, we were using vacuum tube technology, and should, shouldn't... Um, I think in the visions of the future that nourished our boyhoods, we never factored in economics. We never factored in... Um, we, 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 it, it was built on on wonder, utopianism, and perhaps some idealism that, uh, that hasn't really made it to the 21st century. When we were thinking about the future, we didn't imagine shareholders or a, an accountant in the background saying, well, well, what can we do to make all this pay? This is all well and good, but, but, but who's going to pay for this and how are they going to get their money back? Whereas uh, I think this is a reality which uh, space agencies in 2014, the world over, are, of course, uh, having to confront idealism and just pushing back the frontiers of science for its own sake is not actually that compatible. It's not that um, compatible with um, the neoliberalist ethic about, well, yeah, but how's it going to pay for itself? Yeah, but, you know, the, uh, once again, you know, and you, Ed Brubeck, um, who I think is kind of you, um, <laughs> well, they're all kind of me, but uh, <laughs> some more than others, but don't let me interrupt you, sorry. That's all right. Authors don't like to talk about what I'm about to talk about. But it's like, you know, I was just reading about how <clears throat> Iraq, with the interest, is going to cost us $6 trillion. You could go pretty much oh. anywhere you want it with that. And your views of Iraq, I mean, I've never known what an evildoer is. I've never known who possesses weapons of mass destruction other than us. I don't know what a spider hole is. And I don't know what it means to bring people to justice, as W would say. And I don't know why April Glassby told uh, Saddam, hey, go ahead and invade Kuwait. We don't care. It's your business. And, and Brubeck is, is like that. Those are my point of mm. views. Are they your point of views, or are you interested in talking about it? <laughs> um, about the Iraq war? Yeah, just about, well, yeah. what Ed Brubeck says. I mean, it's, it's such yeah, a, sure. lo a logical way of describing it. And when he's at that cocktail party, or no, at the, the wedding, um, wedding, yeah, yeah. He, he, you know, and he realizes he, he realizes he's gone too far, which I do at every mm. cocktail party. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, uh, I think my views would would, would to a certain degree uh, coincide with uh, my character Ed Rubeck's. You notice I'm being tactful and diplomatic. Of course, uh, you are. I am aware that there'll be people listening to this program who will have served uh, in Iraq, and they have knowledge and angles and experiences that um, that I don't, and so it does behove me to be uh, somewhat cautious and respectful of what they've gone through, and to just make it clear that uh, I'm not saying that um, my version of events in Iraq is the only valid one. Uh, it's just, it is the one that the knowledge and the arguments and the logic that I have access to uh, um, add up to being sort of um, the, well the view that I hold uh, I'm not being terribly coherent there but no you can but, but, you can leave but, it be yeah <laughs> you can leave okay, it be. okay um, so yeah um, uh, I, 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 I do uh, I would agree with much of what uh, Ed Brubeck says uh, and thinks and believes, uh, but of course, reality and truth are complex, multiplex things. And anybody who tells you otherwise, they're bad news. Uh, watch out for the demagogues. Watch out for the simplifiers, because as often as not, it turns out they have your hand. Uh, they have their hand in your pocket. Yes, uh, as, as political one way, system. One way or another. Yeah, and that's what politics and religion tend to do. Um, it's really funny too because when I was reading a, when Ed first appeared, I'm thinking to myself as a reader because maybe I wasn't reading as closely as possible. I'm thinking Ed Brubeck, Ed Brubeck, wait a minute, who is he? And then so I'm flipping pages backwards and backwards and backwards, and it took me a while. Oh to... yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah. 
And then I go. So you worked it out. Yeah, I worked it. I worked it out. I was. I thought I was an idiot for not working it out. But then when I did work <laughs> oh, it not out, not really, not really, not really. Uh, I uh, meant to wrong foot you, and um, I'm I, I'm I'm uh, happy rather than um, rather than irritated that you didn't work it out at first, but I'm also pleased that you worked it out in the end. Yeah, he's a boy who Holly meets uh, when they're 15 during her long, strange weekend that uh, that the first novella in the Bone Clocks describes. Um, and, of course, you think you, uh, he's just one more yeah. passing character who you won't be seeing again, but then a couple of novellas on, you get to realise that uh, he's got a much larger role in Holly's life than... Um, and you were led to believe at the time, but isn't that how life works? Isn't that how reality works? Sort of, um, the person you end up maybe falling in love and having kids with even, uh, first time you met them, first few times you met them, perhaps the first two or three hundred times you met them, you had no idea what was, uh, what was in store for you in your joint shared future. Yeah, it's kind of like, also like that movie Sliding Doors, where, you know, you just happen to happen upon, whether it's a woman on the beach writing things in wood or whether it's, um, you know, Ed. And, and what's so funny is one of the presages is, you know, reading a particular postcard in a room and I'm saying, hmm, I wonder who that postcard is from. And why is he? And then you, yeah, and then you talk about Mr. Lamb, who is one of those people I, I said, you know, well, maybe there are, maybe there is some good within the bowels of evil, and um, he has yeah. that. He has a yeah. pure moment. There's this pure moment, and that pure moment somehow survives everything, doesn't it? It does. It does, and it's very really important at the end. Uh, this is a straight lift from Dickens's *A Tale of Two Cities*. Really, uh, the same thing happens in that. Uh, there's a. Um, a character who in the 19th century parliance would be a, 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 a complete wasteful, uh, a cad and a bounder, but he, but, but, but he has the potential for one good deed that, uh, that, that, that happens in the end. Evil in and of itself, good in and of itself, are quite, actually, Manichaean concepts, um, a concept, and in a sense, not that interesting. Evil is only interesting when, sort of, you can, see the motivations inside it and and these terms good and even I'm uh, they're, they're, they're a little bit a comic book and I'm a little bit distrustful of them I think it, it's the novel's job one of the novel's job to actually look at what's motivating the evil and if you like see it from its point of view the more carnivorous immortals they would say that hey you know we're only, we're only trying to do what everyone else is trying to do all we want to do is survive and we have a way to do this which is sort of uh which is not in the normal way of things but nonetheless what's the difference really between this and a uh, heart transplant operation or, or what's the difference between this and eating meat um uh, so i do try to sort of um endow the antagonists in the novel with with a kind of ideology that justifies what they're doing from their point of view that then becomes interesting that becomes something that the reader can think well actually if i was one of them then how would i view things um exactly. i think that's more interesting than just sort of daubing in a black and white sense um the the the, 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 the evildoers uh and and the more angelic side and the more angelic side as well you can see them from a somewhat different point of view they 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 can be fairly pitiless when it comes to making the sacrifices or, or obliging other people to make the sacrifices that have to be made uh in their feud in their war um i'm not quite sure where that answer came from i think i just answered a question you didn't um you didn't actually ask Sam, well but, uh, that's okay those but, are those are the best <laughs> answers i think <laughs> But, you know, it, it is funny because, you know, that, that you do use the metaphor of Hugo when he's doing a certain thing that is naughty, that it's like he's pulling the legs off a spider, um, which is about as bad as you can get. Um, but at the same time, um, there's something else pulling him from within. And it's a, 
it's like what I was saying at the beginning, not to get you more of a swelled head than your tour, your tour will get you, but the reason why, that's what I'm saying about being influential. The reader has, you know, when you're giving the book to the reader and you're kind of saying, okay, you guys figure it out. And, and so what happens is, yeah, you're looking at these guys and you're saying, you know, does, does that, does that make sense? Um, are they justified? And it's like when I said, I don't know the definition of an evildoer. Um, are they justified in doing this? Are, are the bone clock people doing anything different? And so for good or for bad, you leave it up to us, don't you? Uh, well, I like books that do that. I like books that treat me like an adult. Uh, I don't like books that deliberately mystify me, and, and, and I certainly don't hope I don't do that. And I, 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 I hope I uh, provide sort of the tools in the novel that readers need to open it up and see how it works and think about it. I, 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 I hope the novel is a kind of a conversation between uh, me and the reader. Uh, I hope it's an enjoyable conversation for the reader that he or she feels a part of. I don't like being lectured at by novels. Um, and as I say, I don't like ones that deliberately try to mystify me. So all writers are readers as well. And of course, we're greatly informed by the readers that we are. And so I just try to write the kind of books that I'd like to read. Which would lead me to ask you a question about the ending, but I'm not going to. And how come I'm in love with Holly Sykes? Are you in love with her? <laughs> uh, yes, I am, rather. Um, I think at some level I need to be to sort of animate <laughs> her. Um, she, she needs to be someone you care about. She's the glue between all these um, disparate pieces of the novel set in different decades at different different eras at different stages of her life from being a teenager to being a young woman in the 20s to being a mother in the 30s to being a, 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 a reluctant and unlikely writer in her 40s the 50s is a fantastical section that's too bonkers to even get started on through to being a grandmother uh, in her 70s um, about 20 30 years from now in the west of Ireland these are distant and disparate parts and Holly's the glue that keeps them together so if it's not likeable glue then the book's in trouble and I'm in trouble also she doesn't know she's, she does this but she's the sort of person that when she touches your life you she she she, she inadvertently shows you that slightly better maybe nobler human being that you could be some people take her up on this off and become that uh, other people don't but um but she has to be a she has to be a likable and um someone in whose inherent goodness you believe in to for this to be credible so there's a number of reasons i really had to get her right of course she's a, a flawed person as well like all of us she's no saint and she makes mistakes and and and, and uh and the rest of it but um but on balance, I need the reader to be rooting for her. Um, and uh, she is, of course, the novel's most important character. It's her life. Yeah, no, I just finished reading The Light We Cannot See. And um, there's a character in it. And she says, everyone calls me a hero. She goes, I'm not a hero. I just get up in the morning and live my life, don't you? And the other guy says, yeah. and the other guy says no, I don't. I used to. And Oh, Oh, what a great bit of dialogue. Yeah. I mean, it's like, yeah. do I get up and live my life? I wish I could say yes. Uh, yeah, well, maybe it's not yes or no. Maybe it's uh, do you do the best you can as often as you can. Of, 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 of course, life is not a self-help manual. And of course, <laughs> uh, it's messier and more complex. And we get tired and short tempered and impatient and worried and and it's not a, you can't walk around being an enlightened zen monk the whole time it's just uh unless you're squirreled away in a monastery in the mountains in japan or something uh you we we, we have to make compromises and the universe will make a, a thundering fool of us from, from time to time but 
that's part of the course. You can't change what happens to you, but you can work on your attitude to what happens to you. Um, gosh, this is getting quite deep for this time of day. Well, no, well, no, no, that makes me feel better about myself, so I'm glad you answered it, because <laughs> I'm not such a jackass after all. Oh, well, no, we are all jackasses. We always <laughs> will be. But, uh, and, and the more we think we're not, <laughs> you, you can guarantee the more we will be. But, uh, yeah, um, what do we do with our jackassery? How do we respond to our jackassery? <laughs> I guess uh, it depends on whether you're we, an idiot as well. <laughs> do we try to contain it, or um, I never or have. do we let it just um, control uh, our lives for us in an untrammeled and rather miserable way? Um, you just have to do the best you can, don't you? And, yeah, uh, and I think if it bo and, and the bottom line is, if you want to be nice to people and you want to do good, it pretty much trumps all the jackassiness and the idiocy. It does. Yeah, it does. It does. Just. Uh, Think about this a lot as well, but yeah, just I try to be a better human being year by year as I am, and 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 you can kind of mark some progress down the years. I think uh, sometimes sort of an argument, another pointless argument, is about to flare up, and 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 you think actually no, I'm not going to respond to that. Oh. I'll, I'll just let that one go. It doesn't really matter. Being nice is more important than being right all the time. I just did that uh, last night. It, I just, Good for you. And also, you know, the other thing, and I bet you might do it too, is now when I write one of those flaming emails that I write in response to something, I just put, <laughs> yeah. I just put it in the draft folder, and the next yeah. minute I wake up and delete it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, never send an email when you're angry. That's a really good rule of thumb, I think. Almost always reject it. <laughs> And and, and 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 actually, sort of, don't make decisions when you're angry, and don't make judgments when you're angry. Uh, you're not really yourself when you're angry. You're certainly not thinking straight. So don't quite trust yourself when you're angry. There are times when it's necessary, and there are times when a short burst of anger can actually get something done and 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 and, and have a positive effect. But if you can, always use it with a cool head. Except for uh, someone like uh, Christopher Hitchens, who you know was constantly angry, but it, it worked. <laughs> I'm not sure if he was. I think it was. Um, uh, I don't think someone that angry, that genuinely angry, can be that eloquent and that laser guided. Uh, he appeared. I mean, he did um, supportable righteousness. I mean, uh, and 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 I would have felt. Uh, the same about many of the things he said, and, 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 and many of those um, eloquent, eloquent evenings that he, uh, where he kind of held court, uh, which you can now peruse at your leisure on YouTube. Yeah. Uh, but I think I think there was a certain amount of theatricality involved in his anger, um, which actually therefore is not anger at all uh it it it, it, it it it's it's a superbly acted um uh, angry human being but um but 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 um and 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 this isn't to sort of disparage his integrity at all either it's just he was a great great orator and communicator of ideas and he used any means at his disposal to 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 meet that end uh to meet those ends uh including the persona of the righteously angry man. Yeah, I, I agree with you. And I think, um, you know, one, another author is like Stephen Jay Gould, who did the same thing in terms of, hey, this is not religion, this is coincident. And um, yeah. he did that all the time. But uh, yeah. I, I wanted to bring up something because I just read this book called What We See When We Read. And, okay. and I thought about it because what do we see when we read? So like, in my mind, I have a vision, albeit somewhat blurred, of what room 119A looks like. Um, right, right. But I don't know what it looks like. Do you know what it looks like exactly? Uh, I have a vision as well. Uh, I, 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 I'm, I'm deliberately a little bit uh, vague about the exact address of the place, but I've walked past it here in Manhattan a few times and, and looked up at its windows and wondered. Um, but yes, well, that's well, that's the magic of reading. Yeah, uh, these, these these little squiggles of ink on 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 pressed vegetable 
matter that we call a book, that these can act as a conduit from my imagination into yours. Uh, and it doesn't matter if what is in my imagination doesn't correspond even too closely to what's in your imagination. That's a that's a beautiful, mysterious, wonderful thing. And 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 and, um, and um, books and reading are are are, are, a, are a beautiful reason to be alive. That that the behaviour of our species would sometimes suggest we don't entirely deserve. But but but, but thank heavens it's there. So look, I'm thinking of like, here's how I do it. So if you think of the Raven by Poe, I think of this guy who's totally depressed, sitting in a chair with his hand kind of like lank, and in it is a glass of some type of brandy. And he's looking at his mantelpiece and the room is gloomy and the damask curtains are drawn. So what yeah. do you think of that room? <laughs> uh, uh, it's a... Uh... Uh, the imagination builds scenes, it designs sets like you would do if you're making a film. And the exact nature of the set, because it's prompted and triggered um, by, uh, by the words on the page, but you bring your own experience as an avid reader, uh, <laughs> you bring your own experience to, to, that, to that set building, to that act. Um, and um, I apologise. I just had to uh, answer the hotel door there. Um, <laughs> and um, and it's a beautiful alchemy that can link us with people who were born and died a thousand years ago. Reading is just a miracle, isn't it? It is a miracle. It's you know, and if we go back to to Tolstoy, I mean, here's this guy, and you're reading it now. Oh, here's a story. This twelve-year-old kid comes into my bookstore. And he wants to buy War and Peace. He's 12 years old. And yeah. I couldn't sell it to him. I had to give it to him. There's no way a 12-year-old who wants to read War and Peace should have to pay for the book. Oh, here, here. You, uh, you wonderful independent <laughs> bookstore owner. Uh, I, I, I hope your shop exists forever. Uh, you paid a small service to civilization when, uh, when you did that. I, uh, I hope someone did that to you in your past and that and, and you're passing it on and I hope if that kid uh, becomes the adult that uh, it looks as if he might uh, he will also provide the same service to someone in the future because it's more important than money isn't it? Good on you. Good on oh, you Sam. You're Look uh, this is rude um, but uh, my publicist is um, making know. signs in the background and this conversation is a pleasure I I'd like to speak with you all day but <laughs> I know me yeah, too. I've got a patch day in New York today. Uh, uh, I hope we get to meet. Would you be able to come to uh, the library event at all? In, I'm going to try to uh, come to the library event, but I may be, because of where you're staying, I was, I'm almost going to make reservations at the Empire Hotel on Friday. <laughs> but um, hopefully I'll be able to, to get both of them in. And if not, um, when the book turns paperback, maybe we can talk again and spend okay. some more time together. Uh, uh, I'd enjoy that, Sam. And uh, it's been a real, um, it's, it, uh, this has been a very nourishing conversation for me. So thanks for being such an, uh, an attentive and avid reader. And uh, <laughs> look forward to um, when our paths next cross, okay? Likewise. Thank you so much, David. Thank you too, Sam. Okay, right. you have a good day now. You too. That was David Mitchell talking about the bone clocks. And as both of us said, and not to put myself up, but it kind of does. I mean, I could have spoken to him. We didn't even talk about the book, and I always feel bad about that. But I could have talked to him <clears throat> all day long. What a great guy and what an incredible, incredible author. If you haven't read The Bone Clocks, which you probably haven't because it just came out this month, um, uh, you know, there's just so many books. I mean, Cloud Atlas and Black Swan Green, just to start with. And then once you get going, you won't be able to stop. And he really is a true influential person and will be on your life as well. I can't say enough about him, and please go see him at the library this Friday, and I feel bad because you might get to see him, and I think I'm going to be out of town. But um, in any event, I would have um, loved to talk to him some more. So next week, a completely different thing, uh, Ellen Cooney is going to be here, and she's going to be talking about the Mountaintop School for Dogs and other second chances. And I was so sick of dog books. We have tons of dog and cat books in the store, but this isn't that. Um, it kind of 
explores the psychology of dogs at the same time it, you know there's dogs that are damaged for some whatever reason their 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 parents their master and mistress abandoned them or their greyhounds who have been taught to chase a um, a cloth rabbit and are totally berserk but in this case it's set against a backdrop of a woman who is hurt in the same type of way and the book shows how each can heal the other and so it's not really a book about dogs it's a, really a book about how love and how understanding can heal horrible wounds and at the same time in this case uh, bring animal and human being together um, in a way that's uh, feasible, logical, and can actually happen. So, um, again, I mean, I'm so happy about the bone clocks. And join us next week on The Avid Reader when we talk to Ellen Cooney about her book, The Mountaintop School for Dogs and Other, chan other ch Second Chances. So, The Mountaintop School for Dogs and Other Second Chances. Thanks as always. You've been listening to the Avid Reader Show with your host, Sam Hankin. Sam will be back next week with reviews and interviews of some of the more interesting books and authors of today.